to me about how Satan not only attacks the mind, but I want to talk this morning about a little bit more about how Satan attacks the body and just reasons why we suffer in the life that we live. And I kind of wanted to start that off in Job chapter number five and verse number six. And we'll, and we'll go ahead and pray before I get started. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I uh, come before you this morning asking you for your help. And, uh, you know, I have this class ahead of me and, you know, I want nothing more than to be a help to the people here that are here this morning. They didn't have to come here. Um, they didn't have to come in this class specifically. And uh, I'm really appreciative that they did. But I, help, I pray that you'd help me to share something with them that would be a help to them. Lord, I pray that you'd uh, calm my nerves. Lord, you know I haven't done this in a while. And so I pray that you'd have, help everything to come out clearly. And something that is said would just go on in somebody's heart, Lord, for the rest of their life. Something that would encourage them, that would help them. And God, that you would give all the glory and all the honor. Put prayer every, each and every heart and every hearer here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Job chapter number five. I want to start off in verse number six this morning. Verse number six. It says, Although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground. Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. As Job starts this, this chapter, he says Trouble's not, trouble is not dust, but trouble is a lot like dust. And in the sense that trouble at every corner is always springing up out of nowhere. Um, you'll be having a schedule plan. You'll have things going. Next thing you know, you get a flat tire or something random happens all the time. And Job says uh, trouble is like dust where as uh, soon as you get trouble gone, I mean, some of you, you know what I'm talking about when you clean your house and you get rid of the dust and then literally the next day, the dust is back in the same place. Well, that's, that's a lot like trouble. And that's a lot like what Job describes as um, things that come into your life that burden you, that trouble you. And then as soon as you get rid of it, it just springs back up again. But Job, in Job chapter 14, turn there with me. Job chapter number 14, he gives qualifications for the type of people that will go through trouble, the qualifications for it. And the thing, the subject I'm talking about this morning, this is one of the America's biggest objections to God. Because they say, if God is real, why would he allow people to go through things? Why would he allow people to go through suffering? Why would he allow people to go through heartache and affliction and trials? And I started a YouTube channel and I posted a video about two years ago-ish. And it's an atheist asking Kent Hoven, does God exist or who created God? And I put that video on there and it instantly got views. It was like 30,000 views in like six months. And then in this last week, it went from 30,000 to 111,000, like in this last week. And all, a bunch of comments went on there. I couldn't help but like reading them. A bunch of comments on there said there cannot be a God because of such and such. Or, and it was all explaining a heartache and a suffering that someone has went through. And that's one of the people's biggest objections to God is if God is real, why in the world would we go through suffering? Well, Job in Job chapter 14 gives a qualification for people who go through suffering. Job chapter 14, verse number one. It says, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. So we see the qualification right here. If you're born, your life is going to be full of trouble. The qualification was not if you do a bunch of bad deeds. Your qualifications was not if you, if you lie one time, this is going to happen. The qualifications is if you're born, you're going to have days full of trouble. Now, if you're born of a woman. Now, if you're, I guess men now can get pregnant and have babies. I don't know. They may not have any trouble. But if you're born of a woman... That is going to come trouble, and it has nothing to do with God. I want to put that out there. Man is the one that messed this thing up. Yeah, right. Because God started in the garden, even everything perfect, no heartaches, no, no things were supposed to happen. I mean, it was a beautiful garden full of uh, great expectation, great things happening, and then man ruined it. Romans 5, ran, man ruined it, and then started this downhill progression of things. And the thing that I want to point out to you first this morning, you could turn with me to 1 Kings chapter number 17 this morning. 1 Kings chapter number 17, I want to point out to you, it doesn't matter you know, what you do, whether it be bad or good, trouble is going to happen to you anyway, because trouble is just life. Those are things that happened. So for, look with me in 1 Kings chapter number 17 with me, and let's read here in verse number, verse number 1. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, 
As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I sin, there shall not be dew or rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, So you have the Lord coming and talking to Elijah. Get thee hence, turn thee heatsward, and hide thyself by the brook chariot that is before Jordan, and it shall be, thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. So everything's going really good so far. Elijah has gotten a word from the Lord, and he says, okay, I'm going to obey that word. I'm doing everything that you want me to do, Lord. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan, and the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and, and bread and flesh in the evening, and drank of the brook. Bless you. But look at number, verse number 7. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up. Because there had been no rain in the land. You have someone here that is in God's perfect will, but trouble happens. It had nothing to do with Elijah didn't tithe 10%. It had nothing to do with Elijah had made a mistake and had sinned and he didn't obey the God fully. Elijah was in God's perfect will, but yet came up to trouble and came against trouble. We can't find any passage, part in this passage here today that says, oh, well, Elijah messed this up. And we think every time that we have trouble, and I know that Eric was talking to somebody at the hospital the other day, and their child was in the hospital going through something. And the mom's first thought was, what did I do wrong? What, did, what mistake did I miss? I know we messed up for a lot of years, and we got back in church, and we've decided that we're going to give our whole life to God. We're going to commit ourselves to God. And then the moment their kid went into the hospital, they said, oh, this is all my fault. And the thing we think is, if trouble has come into our life, we automatically think that we did something wrong. We cannot make assumptions and say, okay, well, I must have sinned, or this must be something in my past that I'm answering for. It, we, we can be in our life and not have done something wrong, but trouble still come into our life. Another proof for that is in Genesis chapter number 12. Turn there with me. Genesis chapter number 12 this morning. I just want to bring some clarity and just bring an encouragement to you that I know that's our first, cho- our first thought. The moment something bad happens, we always think, what did I do wrong? What mistake did I make? When I, when I stole that the other day or when I, lied, when I, when I stole seven, seven, ten years ago, I, that must be what's happening right now. But in reality, you can be doing nothing and then something bad happens. Genesis chapter 12, and verse number 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of the country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will curse them that curse thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee all the families will be blessed. Man, this sounds fantastic so far. And so Abram departed. Just like the Lord told him to do. Get thee out of here. Go towards Canaan. And so Abram departed, and as the Lord spoke unto him, and Lot went with him, Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And look with me in verse number, let's see here, just twelve, let me look here. In verse number ten. So God had get, told him to go somewhere. He said, I'm going to make thee a great nation. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to, I'm going to, he went so far as to say, people who bless you, I'm going to bless them. People who curse you, I'm going to curse them. He goes through all of this, and he tells them to go somewhere, and he obeys God. But the moment he gets there, verse number 10, and there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Literally, Abraham is obeying God. Abraham is in the perfect will of God. He is pleased with God. God told him he was going to bless him. He told him where to go. And he literally obeys God, goes where God tells him to go. But then there's a famine. But our first thought is, what did I do wrong? He's literally in God's perfect will, and he faces trouble. And just like in 1 Kings, and just like here now, this famine is affecting everybody. And just like in that in First Kings, that drought was affecting everybody. But you know what we do? We say, it's my fault. The reason why all this is happening is because of me. An- another illustration is in Matthew chapter number 3 and verse number 16. Jesus, and I find this interesting, he's born of a woman. So he's going to face trouble. He literally, in, in chapter number 3, verse number 16 he literally, Jesus looks down on him, he's being baptized, and he said, and look at my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. He's literally 
and his father's will. He's being baptized. God has literally just pronounced blessing on him. And then the very next chapter, Jesus is led up into the wilderness by God to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. How do you explain that? You say, well, trouble only comes when I'm doing wrong. Well, not in these cases they don't. And our first thought is, okay, well, I've lived, I've, I've obviously done something wrong to cause this. But that's the problem with assumptions. He was talking about the mindset last week. Our mind, I don't know about anybody in here, but I'm an overthinker. I'm, I'm constantly thinking, okay, I'm overthinking about overthinking. I, I don't know if anybody else is like that. But we can get to a place like that. Well, it puts us in a very bad place. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter number 11. This is the last verse I'm going to have you turn to on this subject here. Hebrews chapter number 11 with me, if you don't mind. I just want to show you one more proof for this. That just because bad things happen and trouble comes up, it does not mean that we're not pleasing to the Lord. It does not mean that we've, we've done something. I want to show you today that suffering is not just because bad things have done. And I'm going to hit on it today. It's not because of self-inflicting things. There are consequences in suffering to re- things that we've done bad. But that's not every single time trouble happens. That's not every single time something bad happens It goes on. Hebrews 11, look with me in verse number, let's see here, towards the end here, verse number 33. Verse number 33, Hebrews eleven thirty-three. with me. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, man, this sounds cool, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lion, that would be awesome. Quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed violently in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women who received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection, and others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder. And were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, and he literally puts all in this category, everybody he just mentioned, all those things they went through, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God provided some better thing for us that they made us should not be perfect. When you look at this, he literally made two distinctions of people. He said, these are people who stopped lion's mouth. These are people who, who uh, sought out kingdoms, quenching the violence of fire. And he gives all these people, people would raise from dead to life again. And then he goes to, but some were tortured. And some went through to trouble. And some were, had a trial of cruel mockings and scourging. Some were stoned. And he puts those two distinctions, but he said these all. So all the people who had great accomplishments that we would look at and say, man, that was great. And all these people who suffered a great deal. He said these all, all these people obtained a good report. So you're looking at people that would say, okay, well, if they're going through all those things, well, they must have done something wrong. Well, the people who had seemed to accomplish great things and the people who suffered a lot, they all obtained a good report. So I had nothing to do with, oh, I did something bad. Some people deserve this and some others. He makes the distinction there. So what I wanted to do today is I wanted to give you five reasons, and I'm not going to be long. I'm not a long-witted person. I might even get done before 1045, um, just to be honest with you. I'm not, I, I don't like sitting for hours on hours on end with someone preaching, and I'm just like, <sighs> I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not that person. So I, to- I totally get it. But what I wanted to do is give you several reasons right quick of why we suffer and why we go through some of the things that we do. The first reason this morning is because we live in a sin-filled world. We live in a a wicked world world that we've seen unspeakable things happen. And we could start going around the whole room, starting from Sarah all the way down to Brother Stephen down here. And I'm sure every single one of you could share stories of something terrible that's happened in this world that that has been affected by us. Just being in a sinful world, we are affected by it. I talk to Brother Eric all the time, him being in CID, and some of the stories that he shared with me, it's just like you just want to grab people and slap them sometimes. And, and, and you're like, that person deserves to be in jail for the rest of their life. And you hear stories like this, and people who choose to do wrong things always affects other people. Your sin choices always affect other people. 
And that's why we live in a world. I mean, when you think of everything from 9-11, that affected the whole world. When you think about school shootings and church shootings and all these different things that have happened in the world, the, can't, the sin, there's a sin that affects every single person. And because of sin, that's why we have diseases. That's why we have cancer. That's why we have had COVID. That's why we have um, diseases being a general thing is because sin, because sin was in the world. Back in the garden, you didn't have diseases. You didn't have sin. You didn't have all these things that would cause us. I mean, you literally had animals that were walking side by side. You see a snake with a, with a cat and a, a lion with a, a tiger. And you see all these animals all in peaceful harmony. And then the next thing you know, when sin comes in, it just erupts everything. And that sin affects us in some way. There's people out there in the world that, that have dealt with things because of people's stupidity. And what we like to do when, when there's sin out there is we instantly blame God. If there is a God, how come this person died? Or how come this little child was abducted? Or, you know, the list goes on and on. But it's because of man and what we've done. Everything was in a harmony before that. So we see the first reason why we suffer is because of sin. Romans 5.12 Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon and all men, for all have sinned. So we see the first reason is self, sin. But the second reason today is selfish people. Selfish people. In Genesis 39, we see how Joseph, the younger brother at the time. Now, is anybody the older sibling in here of a family? Is there anybody older sibling? Y'all two are the oldest siblings? I'm the oldest sibling. You're the oldest sibling? Imagine your younger brother coming up to you and saying, I had a dream. God told me I was going to rule over you. <laughs> rule over you. You're going to bow down to me one day. I would have poked my brother in the eye if he had come up and said that to me. Like I would have slapped him or something. Like, what in the world are you talking about? Well, th- that's, what, that's what Joseph does. Him being literally the youngest brother at that time goes up to all of his brothers and all, his dad and everything. It says, God gave me dreams that I'm going to rule over you. You're going you're gonna to bow down to me. All this stuff's going to happen. So he has all these expectations of these things that are going to happen, and it made his brothers hate him even more. So he has all these expectations of these amazing things that God has given him in this dream, and then next thing you know, he's sold into slavery. So that is not going like he thinks it's going to go. Well, now he gets brought to Potiphar's house, and he gets in there, and he gets promoted, and now he's thinking, oh man, things are starting to look up now. I had this expectation. God told me what was going to happen. Yeah, he gets in Potiphar's house. Next thing you know, Potiphar's wife tempts him. She, and then he flees. He doesn't want to lay with her. Next thing you know, Potiphar believes his wife over Joseph, throws him in jail, throws him in prison. Well, he has this expectation of this is what's going to happen. Now it's, now it's downhill again. Like what in the world's going on? He's in the, the prison and there's two guys in there, a butler and a baker. And the baker doesn't make it out too well, but... They both have dreams, and they say, Joseph, like, like we, we have these dreams. And if I was Joseph, I'd be like, yeah, you guys are on your own. I'm done with this dream business. Like, I don't, these dreams have gotten me nowhere so far. Like, I'm not helping you. You're on your own. But Joseph says, okay, let me hear the dreams. And he interprets these dreams, and the baker doesn't make it, but the butler ends up getting out of prison to go back and work with Potiphar. And he says, hey, if you're, while you're out there, please put in a good word for me. And so the butler leaves all excited, gets out of the prison. He doesn't tell them about Joseph for two years. He literally sits in prison for another two years. So as you were thinking, if I was in Joseph's position, the moment the butler got out and was going to Potiphar, I'm thinking, okay, well, this is where it comes. This is where it happens. Everything's starting to go uphill again. And then next thing you know, you're sitting there for two years. And 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 you go through all of this stuff. And he finally gets out and he finally, finally gets promoted. And he, all this stuff finally happens. He finally becomes king. But he went through everything that he went through. We know, we realize that he went through everything he went through for a good reason. We realize that at the end. But in the meantime, what is Joseph thinking? And he's looking. He didn't, and, and the Bible never records Joseph sinning one time. Now, that doesn't mean that Joseph didn't sin. He definitely did all have sinned. But he, it doesn't say that he handled anything wrong in this scenario. But he got to this and went through all of this because of selfish people. And you realize that every, like a lot of us have gone through sufferings. A lot of us has gone through trials in our life because of stupid people. I'm, I'm sure I, I say stupid. I probably shouldn't say that. Selfish people. There's people that choose to do what they want to do despite what you, like despite about your feelings or what you care. 
people have betrayed, people have done things to you, and you could probably think of some things, and you've had to suffer some loss or suffer some things, whether it be mentally or anything, because of people being selfish. And that's the way that it was with um, Judas Iscariot. The reason why Jesus had to suffer is because Judas betrayed Jesus. Because he wanted the money. He wanted to, to go that. And now we're glad that he suffered. But he went through that because of someone betraying him. That's what he went through. Tell me if you would to Joshua chapter number 7 this morning. We are doing some flipping. But I would rather use more of the Bible than not. You know, the, using the Bible. You can never go wrong with the Bible. If I left here today and you're like, man, my kid, he, he was a boring teacher. I'm glad to be out of that class. Well, you can never say that I didn't use Bible for what I said. And you can leave out here saying, okay, well, I, at least I heard that from the Bible. If you didn't do your Bible reading this week, you're like, okay, I made up for it. We're all good. Joshua chapter number seven. I want you to look at this because selfish people look with me in, in chapter seven, verse number one. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, a lot of, he's the son of a lot of people of the tribe of Judah took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So God literally says, Achan, or the children of Israel, he was telling everybody, Jude, all these people, he said, do not take from these camps that you're you're going against. There's going to be gold there. There's going to be um, different things there, but do not take of the accursed thing. And so Achan, being selfish and doing what he wants to do, takes a wedge of gold and a Babylonian garment or Babylonian garment. And the next thing you know, after he takes these things, they go to war and they lose 36 people. They, 36 people die because he took that. That's 36 fathers. That's 36 brothers. That's 36 sons. That's 36 people who did not have to die, but because someone was selfish and did what they wanted to do, other people suffer. And not only that, you know, he steals it. And the thing, the thing to me, and, and you could probably realize this as well, sin makes people stupid. You know why? He got a wedge of gold in the Babylonian garment. Where in the world are you going to spend a wedge of gold in the desert? Yeah. Sin makes you stupid. He's got a Babylonian garment, something you put on in front of everybody. Where in the world is he going to wear that among the children of Israel in the desert? But he literally gets this and hides it. What was the point of getting it? Well, he obviously was selfish. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. He didn't think about the consequences of, okay, well, what, is this, what if this affects other people? And that's what we have in our life. We have people that make decisions and do things not based on anybody else's feelings, but because they want to do what they want to do. And sometimes that affects other people. So not only do we see sin causes suffering and we see that um, we see that selfish people and we see um, these other things. But lastly, I want you to or not lastly, but the thirdly, I want you to notice is we suffer sometimes because of self-inflicted things. Self-inflicted. As you see here in Joshua chapter number 7, at the end of that chapter, he ends up dying. He caused the suffering on himself because of the decision that he made. He ends up being uh, stoned to death. And there's a lot of suffering out in the world today. People drinking alcohol leads to 300,000 alcoholics dying each year. Three million die worldwide annually because of alcohol-related events. So not only are they putting suffering on themselves, they're affecting other people as well. 106,699 people died from ODs annually. Cigarettes killed 443,000 people each year. You realize that these are self-inflicting things. These are things that people have chose to put on themselves. And when you think about it, The two thieves on the cross next to Jesus, literally, they put themselves there. They were murderers. They were thieves. They put themselves on the cross. And they're literally, the guy's on the cross and he's railing on Jesus. And the other thief has to speak up and say, hey, we we deserve to be here. We put ourselves here. But literally, he is blaming God and he's railing on Jesus. And there's... And we always do that when we put ourselves in situations. We always say, well, God, God's just putting me through some suffering and God's making me do this. Well, you're an idiot. You're the one yeah. that stole. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you've ever talked to a homeless person or if you've talked to someone who's gotten themselves in a bind and they literally, when you talk to them, hey, how are you doing? Well, uh, God's just putting me through the ringer right now, brother. You're the one that's in jail for what you just did. God's not putting you through anything. And so you're the one that's suffering. Did that scare you? 
I'm used to breaking other people's stuff by accident. I know, me too. Me too. There's no worries. But those, those two thieves put themselves there. The one is literally blaming God. And you see the two perspectives during suffering. And that one person's blaming God, but he put himself there. Another self-inflicting thing. Turn with me to Acts chapter number 21, if you would. Acts chapter number 21. We'll see someone else who, a, a great person of the faith, one of the, probably the greatest Christian in the world, even self-inflict something on him. Acts chapter number 21. Acts chapter 21 and verse number, let me look at the time here, make sure I'm doing good. Acts chapter number 21, verse number four. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go to Jerusalem. So the Holy Spirit literally tells Paul not to go to Jerusalem, but Paul goes to Jerusalem anyway. He had a burden, he had things that he wanted to accomplish, and you see the results of that, chapter 21 and verse number 30. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the, sh- the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came of the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. So e- literally all of Jerusalem is in an uproar because Paul went there, and they're trying to kill Paul. When you look down in, uh, further in verse number, let's see here. Let me, let me see here where that, chapter 23, verse 12. Chapter 23, verse 12. Look at what else has happened because Paul went to Jerusalem. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they should neither eat nor drink till they've killed Paul. In verse number 13, there was 40 of them that were in this conspiracy. So literally, 40 people, the whole city's up in an uproar. Jerusalem is trying to kill Paul. And then literally 40 people get together and bound themselves under a conspiracy that says we're not going to eat or drink anything until we've killed Paul, Paul, until we've destroyed Paul. You realize none of that had to happen if Paul would have just listened and gone to where God wanted him to go and not did what he wanted to do? That was a self-inflicting thing. And we can't get in the moment of that. And those things are more obvious. We, sometimes we think, okay, well, what's going on? And we, can, we should never make assumptions saying that, Okay, well, I did this or God's doing this to me. We should never make assumptions. But sometimes it's obvious. Achan stole that and he knew something was coming and God did something with it. There's sometimes we do things and like if you, if you rob a bank, um, I think cops are going to probably arrest you. I mean, I, think, I don't think we have to go do deductive reasoning. I don't think we have to go through all this research to see if that's going to happen. That's kind of obvious that's something you're going to deal with if you steal or if you rob a bank or if you kill somebody. So the, some of these things are obvious when you self-inflict, when you do things on yourself. So that's where some of the suffering comes in. But turn with me to 1 Peter chapter number 4. With the next one I want you to notice, 1 Peter chapter number 4, is suffering for the Savior. 1 Peter chapter number 4. 1 Peter chapter number 4. The worst fear you can have is like when you go to turn to a a passage and it's not there in the Bible anymore and you can't find it. That's like the worst fear in the world. It's like it was here yesterday and you're like trying to find it. First Peter chapter number four and verse number 12, suffering for the Savior. Behold, think it not strange concerning the fiery child, which is to to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matter. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify on this behalf. There's some suffering that you do, you're doing for the reproach of Christ. There's some things at times where you're, you're serving God and you're pleasing God, and there's some suffering that you may have to go through. You know, where you hear about people being put in prison, or the prophets, and, and all these different people. And I, I believe it goes on to that same chapter. I know it does in First Thessalonians, I believe. It talks about them persecuting you just like they did the prophets. And there's some suffering you're going to have to go through, some, some in our day, I, it may not be as major. Some, some it may just be a you know, smack on the wrist or people cussing you. I know when we go on the street, um, my dad, when we were in Georgia, uh, we were street preaching, holding signs, handing out tracks the whole nine. 
And someone came by, and like Brother Eric said, he said they gave us a wave, but with not all the fingers were up. And um, he, they flicked us off. And my dad, just with his different perspective, him being out there, he's like, yes, he is number one. Amen. You know, and there's sometimes that that might just be some of the stuff that we go through. Sometimes it might be that, you know, it, it might come to a point where we have to suffer more for Jesus. Some people are called to suffering. But when we do go through that suffering, we should just be exceeding happy. And it's hard to say it in the moment. But being exceeding happy that we get to suffer for the Lord and, and for his name. Matthew 10, 5 verse 10 through 12 says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. So even a part of it suffering is maybe even people talking bad about you for doing things for the Lord. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Romans eight seventeen says, And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, even so we that suffer with him may also be glorified together. Yea, all, 2 Timothy 3, 12, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So the last point that I want to make here this morning of the reasons why we suffer is not only sin, not only selfish people, not only self-inflicted. We, sometimes we suffer for the Savior. But lastly, Satan is the reason why we suffer. When you look in Job chapter number 2, and you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. But in Job chapter number 2, in verse number 4 through 8, I'll read that to you right quick. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all the man hath he will give for his life. But put forth hand, his hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. And that's a question I would ask you. If, 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 if Satan was looking at your life, could he say that if I just took some things from them, they'll just give up on God? Now, I can't say that about my life. I can't say that about your life. But if, God, if Satan was to say, Hey, God, let me take what Brother Chris Lyons has. Let me take everything from him. When I take all the, the material goods that he has, he's just going to give up on God. He's, gonna, he's never going to serve you ever again. He, it wasn't accurate when he talked about Job, but would it be accurate when he talked about us? I can't make that statement for everybody, but that's what he did to Job. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul has been given, a, been given an abundance of revelations. And so Satan sends a... Um, a messenger or a messenger of Satan was sent to Buffett. And what Buffett means is to literally like punch. He's Satan. Satan has sent a messenger to Buffett Paul. And that's the thing that he'd gone through. He was trying to get it to, to go away the thorn. But Jesus said, God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Whatever you're going through, I'm going to help you. So the way that I want to end kind of this morning and, and does anybody have the time? It's 1026. Okay, so we're probably going to end like 10 minutes early. Um, some things to think about when we go through suffering. The number one thing to think about when we go through suffering is it's to help others when they go through the things that they've gone through. You know, me and you have talked about this before, Hunter. You know, the, some of the stuff that you had shared with me that you've gone through. You've talked about, well, because I went through that, I can help other people who go through the same situation. And that's what the disciples in the storm did. They're, the disciples are literally going through the storm and they think they're going to lose their life. But then on the other side, there's a maniac of Gadara sitting there waiting for them. They watched the whole thing and they came down there. And because they went through that storm, they were able to get to the other side and help somebody else. So what you're going through, think about it as to help others going through what they're going through. And the statement that I want to make right quick, don't be like Job's comforters. Don't be like someone whenever they're going through suffering that you're a miserable comforter, that you're able to help other people. I know for me personally, um, me and my wife went through a time where we had we have lost a baby before, and we've had people come up to us and say some stupid things, like stupid things. Well, at least the baby wasn't born yet, you know, just, just a bunch of stuff. And sometimes people are miserable comforters, which you can't take that. Can't take that to heart because sometimes people mean well, you know, but try to be that good comfort to other people, you know, when they're going through things, when they're because we all face different things. You know, we all go through different struggles, but just being able to be there for people, you know, it's it's a blessing. Number one, to help others. Secondly, hell is what we deserve. 
So anything outside of that is a blessing. I remember there's a, there's a lady in our church um, back in Georgia, and she had she got cancer. They told her she didn't have long to live, and they said that you're never going to have any more kids ever. Like they, they told her that. And God ended up saving her from that. She completely, the cancer was gone. She was able to have another kid literally right after that. It was a blessing, like everything that she, she was able to see. God, God just moved in an amazing way. Um, but she came to my dad and said, why am I going through these things? And my dad just simply said to her, why not? Why not? What we deserve is to go to hell forever, but Jesus Christ has given grace to us be able to be saved and be able to go to heaven forever. So why not go through those things? And and I'm not saying that because of that, but when we change our perspective a little bit. um, But thirdly, he is going to revenge us. When people have put us in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1, a great, great passage of scripture, he says he's going to bring vengeance on those who trouble us and those who, and recompense us by those who make us go through affliction. So suffering help us to help others. Hell is what we deserve he is going to revenge us, but suffering helps us to grow. Romans 5, 3 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worked with patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So when we go through things, it helps us to grow as people. When we, when we are in our comforts all the time, we never grow. You know, y'all might have different ventures of things y'all do, business or whatever, but you'll never grow unless you get out of your comfort zone. When you go through things, that's what helps you grow. Secondly, suffering helps us to see the grace of God. I had mentioned that in 2 Corinthians 12. But thirdly, it's to glorify God. 1 Peter 4, 16 says, Yet if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him, um, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So when you're going through these things, and, and you see this with, if you're, two, two things. If you're suffering because it's self-inflicted things, glorify God anyway, because he didn't have to give you grace and forgive you for those things. But secondly, give him glory, um, even if it's not self-inflicted, just say, God's with me, and I'm, I appreciate everything God's done. And lastly, get excited for the Lord's return. And this is the last thing I'm going to mention. The church in Thessalonica had people dying. They had persecution that was going on through that church. But literally Paul's admonition was them is, hold on, Jesus Christ is coming back soon. And so that, that's the admonition I would give to you today is, okay, we're going through some things, but there's coming a day where we're never going to have to go through those things again. And Jesus Christ's intent was at the beginning that everything was going to be perfect, but at the end, everything's going to be perfect again, and we're never going to have to deal with those things again. And so that's what I want to share with you today. And, and a perspective, Job suffered, because he, but because he stayed true to God, God gave him back double what he had before. Joseph suffered and went through those things, but now he's a ruler and saved tons of people. And literally, when they counted it, it was up to 70 years that he was able to live and be as a ruler after that point of suffering. And he was able to see his grandchildren and be with his grandchildren after that. So God will reward you if you, if you not only suffer with him, but you just stay true, no matter what things you're going through. I know we all have some different struggles. You probably have things in your own life right now that someone might not even know about. But I can tell you the one thing that we're praying for you. But just realize and and just get excited and and that the Lord's coming back soon where we're never going to have to deal with anything ever again. And we'll just be able to be with the Lord. and.